from the Figure Four Online Studios in beautiful Bothell, Washington, exclusively at WrestlingObserver.com. You're listening to The Brian and Vinny Show with your hosts, Brian Alvarez and Big Vinny V. And Craig. All right, now we're ready to go. It's so right, Vinny Show, everybody, and Craig. All right, well, let's uh, let's get going on Nitro. Nitro. Uh, announcers were running down the show. Rick Flair stormed the desk, desk to cut an impromptu promo threatening Arn Anderson, and he left. Lex Luger versus Randy Savage. He had all the video packages saying how this got set up and how Luger was spending his WCW career on the line. The, and also watching these video packages later in the show, keep in mind, the Giant had only been making, you know, he had made at this point perhaps a dozen appearances before a live crowd. They were always very careful to have Kevin Sullivan or Zodiac or somebody out there very close with them to tell them what to do at all times. Maybe that made me laugh when I realized it. So, Savage and Luger was fun. They went back and forth. Had a long battle over a backslide, which would be the last time that ever happened in a major U.S. match. And uh, fans didn't really have a favorite. It cheered for both guys. And they're fighting, and uh, a ref got bumped. And, of course, right after the ref gets bumped, Randy Savage says, This is a great time to hit a body slam and my big elbow off the top rope. So he does that. There is no ref. Giant appears, choke slam Savage to death, and then leaves. And then rather than make a cover... Luger decided to lift Savage Savage's dead body up and put him in the torture rack for the submission. And the announcers were debating whether or not Luger had realized the Giant had even been there because he'd been, you know, selling the elbow. So, uh, fun seesaw match, a screw finish, but it's a screw finish that fits in perfectly with the storyline. A couple of things. First off, uh, as, as Vinny had noted, uh, Nitro number five is now listed as Nitro number five on the Apple TV and not like Nitro 78 or whatever. And they finally found Nitro four. That's right. They finally put it up there. Uh, show open with the announcement of a double main event. Luger versus Savage. Flair versus Arn. Bischoff going crazy in the booth. And it was... You could watch this, and it was no shocker to see how cool this show must have been going head-to-head versus Raw on the other channel. So, they have this match. And I'm glad you mentioned the backslide. Because I thought that was the best thing in this whole match. A fight for a back slide. You never even see this anymore. And it was a full minute, this fight. It started off with, I think, Savage went for a hip toss. Or maybe Luger went for a hip toss. And Savage slowly turned it into the back slide. And they fought back and forth. And then Savage almost won, but Luger had his foot on the ropes. And he fought his way through. And then finally he backslid. It was so great. And it was like... I can't remember who said this, but it's true. If you're having a real fight and you're in UFC, then if you do something with lightning speed, it's so awesome. But in pro wrestling, you don't want to do something with lightning speed. You want to do it nice and slow and in as dramatic a manner as possible. That's what gets people into a pro wrestling match. And that's what they did with this backslide. I thought it was so great. Dave gave this a star at the time. I probably did as well. Things have changed. And I love the finish because the storyline they've been doing, it was a perfect finish for the storyline. You watch Raw and it's just like a bunch of fuckers run in for a DQ. And it's like the general story is that Seth is running in on everybody. Okay, that story sucks. But this story here, it made sense because Luger and the referee were down. The giant choke slam Savage. Did Luger know? Did he not? It perfectly played into the storyline. Savage doesn't trust Luger. So this, you know, furthered the thing with Savage. I just thought this whole thing was awesome. Going back to the beginning of the show, it was, uh, we've watched, this is number five. We've watched all five of them so far. It was cool to see the progression of them dumping money into the company. Because the first one, of course, was in the mall. Yeah. The second one was in an arena, but the stage setup was very small. This one, they pulled out all the stops. They had the lighting rigs, big explosions, the the ramp, and uh, it's just cool to see 
somebody taking an interest in wrestling and actually dumping money into a company that was looking for a fight. That's right. So Eddie Guerrero, yes, that Eddie Guerrero, was scheduled to wrestle Dean Malenko, but instead Disco Inferno came out to dance. Then Disco's music stopped. Eddie's music started. Disco was appalled. Then Eddie appeared and told him to beat it, and Disco ran away. That is how future world champion Eddie Guerrero made his debut on Monday Night Cable Television. You know what made me so mad about it? During the match... Yeah, things got worse. They're having this Eddie Guerrero-Dean Malenko match. And they cut to Hulk Hogan arriving in his limo. Yeah. And Jimmy Hart has to alert him about what the big stinky giant has done. <laughs> yes. They have to do a cut in in the middle of the match. Not not just a two screen cut in. No. A full screen. A full screen cut in. So, and by the way, at the time, people were absolutely infuriated about this. Yes. And it was even more infuriating because when you really think about it, let's just say that they did not have time with one hour to get this Hulk Hogan thing in, and so they felt they had to insert it in the middle of the match, why couldn't you cut Disco Inferno dancing <laughs> and put that segment there? That's a great question, The Brian. only reason he was there, apparently, was so they could play his fucking music. That's what made me so mad about it. Just replace Disco Inferno with your Hulk Hogan segment, everybody's happy. But no, it had to be a cut in in the middle of this match, which made both guys look like geeks. Yeah. I remember at the time people were outraged and just losing their minds at how dare Hulk Hogan's ego get in the way of these two amazing wrestlers in the ring. And I'd forgotten about this. And I called my son in because he's going to see a classic. Well, apparently I should have showed him the one that they hadn't or the many they had in ECW instead of this one. He lost interest very quickly. Yeah, match was fine, but uh, it looked choreographed start to finish. They were not their it, best match. You know match. what this looked like? This looked like what every, to me, this looked like what every Ring of Honor match is trying to be. Hmm. They were doing a bunch of stuff. It's very athletic. It's very choreographed. Not a lot of uh, emotion from either guy. Crowd wasn't, well, crowd, Ring of Honor usually likes it, but uh, yeah. It was just kind of there. They've had much better matches. Dean Malenko is kind of like uh, Christopher Daniels. He's so good at what he does. It looks almost mechanical. Well, Malenko's always looked mechanical. And it's it's like he's it's like he's wrestling without emotion. You know what I mean? Yes. That was his whole career. That was his gimmick. Yeah. <laughs> Him and Candido. Okay. Yeah. Great wrestling robots. Sure. Yeah. So Eddie won. With a roll up, and then Malenko said, "You got lucky. I want a rematch." And Eddie said, "Anytime." Hogan and Jimmy Hart came out for a promo. Hulk talked about spending time with the little Hulkamaniac, getting ready for a double lung transplant. And that little guy told him to go to Denver and take care of the giant. That's right. You know what I thought when he said that was, you know, he's talking about a probably a Make a Wish kid or something. Sure. Or I don't know who. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, it's like John Cena. John Cena was a big Hulk Hogan fan. And so I was like, maybe John Cena could go back and watch some of this Hulk Hogan stuff because Hulk Hogan came out here in a neck brace, which he had been wearing for three weeks now, ever since his neck was twisted by the giant. And he wasn't making jokes about it either. No, he did not show up the next fucking day completely fine yeah. and making jokes about how a big stinky giant twist. He was still in a neck brace. So he vows to go backstage, find the giant, rip him apart. He goes to high-five some fans in the crowd first. And a little old woman throws powder in his eyes and starts whacking him with her cane. Now, obviously this turned out to be Kevin Sullivan in disguise. But before that was revealed, as a little old woman is whacking the world champion with a cane, Mongo says, you know, this is what makes Nitro so exciting. Yeah, Old maybe. women beating up our champion. Because it was grandma. She finally showed up. That's true. I, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. She got out of the bathroom, got back in the wheelchair, yep. got out of the and bathroom, found her way to, down, went to Denver. Yes. And Mongo was laughing the yes. whole time. Yes. Yeah. This was high comedy for Mongo. Yes. This is not good. The most amazing part of this segment is they start shaving off Hogan's beard. Yeah, Zodiac and Giant came out. That's mustache. right. Yeah. yeah, they start shaving off his mustache. And... 
so they're facing the hard camera mm-hmm. because they want you to see Sullivan shaving off the mustache. Mm-hmm. Sullivan's got this electric razor, and it's right there on Hulk Hogan's face. Yeah. So these baby faces start running in. Yes. And the big show, the giant, starts choke slamming him. Right. And Sullivan has the razor right on Hulk Hogan's mouth. Yep. And the giant delivers this big fucking choke slam, which causes the ring to bounce. Yes. And Sullivan nearly cuts Hulk Hogan's head off with this razor. <laughs> like, it's so bad that you see Hogan go, oh, fuck. And he rolls over. And then the rest of the time, you, like, see Sullivan looking around like, is anyone about to take a bump as I shave this fucker's mustache off? He nearly killed this guy. He almost shaved his nose clean off his face. I like that he shaved off the Fu Manchu, but at first he almost left a Hitler stash. He did. <laughs> he did. He, he was really leaving did. that there for comedy. Yes. So the uh, tenant of Hogan and the bad guys just left. I like the Zodiac's in there with scissors. And, and he he's threatening, threatening to cut Hogan's hair. And then he just looks at him for a while and then he just doesn't do it. Yes, I, got, he's I guess enough. it's a yes, no gimmick. I suppose. I'm going to cut his hair. Oh, no, I'm not going to. Well, you know, he used to be the barber and then yeah. he had second thoughts. Exactly. So the main event was Ric Flair versus Arn Anderson. Gosh, I have not watched. I have not watched Arn Anderson wrestle in far too long. Oh right. yeah, it was great. Arn Anderson was great, indeed. Capital G great. He had a very very fun match, and uh, Flair was the I, I guess the baby face, but really they just went back and forth the entire time. And Flair finally gets the figure four. Actually, got he he hooked the figure four. Then Arn got the ropes. So Flair dragged him back to the middle of the ring and put the figure figure four on the other leg. So he's got that on. And then Brian Pillman runs out. He runs to the top rope. The referee looks up. He sees a third wrestler not in the match on the top rope and says, no, this is bullshit. And he calls the DQ. Actually, I think this was a classic example of Nick Patrick sucking at his job. That's possible, too. Flair beat Arn. The official result was Arn submitted. See, mm. and and the timing was just horrendous. Like Nick Patrick, I don't know. Nick Patrick always did that. It's just like just ring the bell. Like he had to wait for the guy to verbally say I submit and maybe have it n- notarized or something like that before he'd call for the fucking bell. So the timing was just terrible here. I could talk for like fifteen minutes about these men's punches. Very good. Oh my gosh, the snap! Oh man, Arn Anderson was a amazing ring general. Yeah. And well, Flair was in the ring with Arn. Well, don't get me wrong. I don't know if ring general is a proper term in this. Just particular. watching these guys trade punches was a thing of beauty. I like that they just went back and forth for eight minutes without stopping. They just went and went and went and worked their asses off. Yeah, that too. That too. Yeah. I love this. It's a good match. So it they, was a good match. They did this. And then they announced that next week there's going to be a cage match, Flair versus yeah. Arn in a cage match live on Nitro, as well as Sting versus Shark, Mr. JL against Sabu. That's right, Mr. JL. That's what they came up with for Jerry Lynn. Mr. JL. And then Big Bubba versus Hawk. All of which was booked because they got killed in the ratings war the week prior. They were already panicking. Five nitros in. In fact, they called Flair back early. He'd had eye surgery. And he wasn't supposed to be back for a month. They called him back two weeks later so that they could get him an Arn so they could try to pop a rating. Wow. And if you watch the match, Arn poked his eye. (laughs) I was like, really? I know it's fake, but I mean, come on. That's a high risk maneuver right there. So, yeah, I love one hour. Mm-hmm. No matter no matter what happens, you watch it because it's only an hour long. You know what I mean? You, oh, you I know. See a tag match on Raw and you start to fall asleep because you got three hours. Yeah. But you watch every moment of this match. And the best part of this show is the announcers are wrapping it up and it's about to go off the air. And all three of them cheer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, yeah, hey, Nitro! And it goes off the air. I was like, God damn, this is great. Back in the good old days, cheering when Nitro went off the air. It wasn't always like this, everybody. No. It gets gets bad. It does. As Craig will read in this book, Death of WCW, available on Amazon.com and fine booksellers October 14th. So we watched Nitro. 
October 9th, 1995. It was the worst Nitro we have seen so far. Really? I thought so. Probably was. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe. They, all, they all run together. I suppose. They were in Chicago, so the announcers did a goofy bit with their backs to the camera to show off they were wearing Bears jerseys. I don't know where Bobby Heaton got a Chicago Bears jersey that instead of a number had a question mark. That's pretty great. Probably had it made. I guess. So Sting crashed the desk ranting and screaming like a lunatic about how he was going to bring peace to Randy Savage and Lex Luger. Just the most irrational plea for rational behavior ever. <laughs> By the way, why don't, you, why don't you say that one more time? What did I say? No, just say it one more time. What? What you just said. Sting crashed the desk, ranting and screaming like a lunatic, vowing to bring peace between Randy Savage and Lex Luger. Okay. I just, I just want everyone to remember that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. I see where you're going now. Mm. So Sting did this, then he went to the, to the ring to wrestle Shark. He introduced Shark as healing from Tsunami. I don't think they know what that word means. I was baffled. I had to rewind it to make sure that I'd heard what I thought I heard. Yep. But they did, in fact, bill him as being from Tsunami. So he has some hideous gear on that I believe had black and white and gray and blue and purple and red and lime green. Hey, he's a, he's a fish. Yeah. <laughs> they, they sometimes have a lot of colors. Not sharks. Well, he's not really a shark. <laughs> Wait well, a minute, what? <laughs> he's got me there. <laughs> Was that an intentional little buzz there? No, but it was well-placed. <laughs> so uh, the match went like a minute, and Sting hit some stinger splashes from behind and knocked uh, Shark over the turnbuckle into the post. Then he hit a flying crossbody for the win because Shark uh, was not going to go into the scorpion. Let's think about this for a second. So Sting runs across the ring, and he jumps up into the air. Yes. He jumped and then the he shark. descends on... Oh! <laughs> Actually, I had none of that. He did. Just... He did jump the shark. You're right yes. about that. No, but he ran across the ring... Way back in 1995. And then he leaped into the air. <laughs> right. And then he came down onto the shark. Yes. Sure. Which propelled the shark up. Yes. How? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just making sure that I Wrestling. saw that correctly. But I got to say one thing about the shark. This guy, John Tenta. Yes. That was his name. He had a lot of shitty names and gimmicks. Yeah. Not a bad worker. Oh, no. No. And and certainly not by today's standards. Ooh. He was he was very good. Mm -hmm. One minute Sting sold babyface high cross off the top one two three, and then what did Eric Bischoff say? He screamed, "That's why he's the U.S. heavyweight champion, not the world champion." No, the point is that's yeah. why he's a champion. It's right? Champions win because an A lister beat a B lister. Right? That doesn't happen nowadays. No. no. I liked this. All we get is D-listers beating each other. It's Basically, true. yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. This was very rushed, though. Like, yeah, the just... entire show. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. They showed, for the second time in eight minutes, they showed Kevin Sullivan and the giant attacking Hulk Hogan and sh shaving off his mustache. Sabu... Sabu, they showed this so many times, I thought The Rock was going to make an appearance later in the show. Sabu versus Mr. JL. That would be Jerry Lynn under a mask. Or a chance of Hogan sucks here. That didn't take long. So they were doing moves in the ring. And then Sabu just stopped selling and hit an Arabian press, hit an Arabian press in the camel clutch. And uh, then J J Mr. JL stopped selling and hit an elevated DDT. Then Sabu stopped selling and hit a Frankensteiner. And uh, Sabu no sold the landing. <laughs> and when JL tried to dive off the top, Sabu caught him with a power bomb and a camel clutch for the win. It was a contest to see who could sell the least. There was a lot of no selling in this particular match here. Yeah. And you know the thing that I noticed about this show was this was the show that started the trend of to the back. Mm -hmm. One segment after another ended and they just moved right on. Yeah. This match here, they did a bunch of they did like a two minute match, maybe. I don't even know how long it was. It was very short. Do a million moves. Nobody does any selling whatsoever. And then when it's done, Sabu went to ringside, and he starts... Well, first he did a sunset flip powerbomb over the top rope, mm -hmm. and then he starts destroying a bunch of stuff at ringside. Yes. And they cut away to Eric Bischoff, who is busy talking about what's coming up next. Yeah. And in the background, you could still see them brawling. Yes. They did the same thing in the opener after Sting won a one-minute match. 
They're in the middle of showing a replay, and they cut to Eric because he's got to talk about what's coming on the show. Yeah. And I was sitting there thinking, if you would take this show and you take every single segment and you double the length, you got a two-hour show. And it probably would have been a good two-hour show. But instead, what has happened today is you do this show, and then you do it again. <laughs> right? That's what Impact does. Yeah. yeah. They do they do this one-hour Nitro where everything happens too fast. You don't remember anything that happens on the show, and they double it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think this is that hard, but apparently it is. <laughs> apparently it's a struggle to find out how to how to do a wrestling show correctly. A lot of times with wrestling and this, you know, less is more. And uh the the 1 hour shows that we've been watching were very well paced. Um on this Nitro, they were starting matches or they were coming back from commercial, there'd already be a guy in the ring. Yeah. And and somebody would be coming down. Um, I mean, we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but Flair didn't even get to like do his entrance. He just had to march down to the ring, come, you know. Yeah. And everything was very, very much rushed on the show. I don't know what was uh what I don't changed? know what was going on. Like, well, what changed was they were trying to beat Raw. Yeah. They they were five weeks in, they were already doing crazy stuff. They're rushing. Crash TV. Trying to get people not to turn the channel. They're booking cage matches. Yeah. Bloom already coming off the rose, but. So the next segment was a promo with some very passionate delivery and absolutely zero logic. Sting and uh, Lex Luger, as noted, were already in the ring. Luger's mullet, by the way. I don't know if we talked about this yet. Phenomenal. Wasn't as good as Benoit's mullet. No, that's true. That's true. But it was a great mullet. So they're in the ring, and then they call out Randy Savage, and he comes out. So Sting points out that Randy Savage is paranoid. And as you noted, I love that Randy Savage's character was, in fact, he's a paranoid lunatic. Yeah. Who talked funny. Who talked funny. <laughs> and uh, Sting points out the Giant is winning. He's chokeslamming everyone. He's chokeslamming Luger. He's chokeslamming Savage. And then Savage pointed out he's not chokeslamming you. And so... Things go on for a while, and Savage says, look, we all want to be champion. Sting says, that's right. So he proposes, to. this is his solution. This to, is his way to bring peace. Yes, to, to, sell, to settle the differences between Randy Savage and Lex Luger. Yes. At Halloween Havoc, if Lex Luger beats Meng, and if Randy Savage beats Kamala. This sounds familiar, by the way. Then Luger and Savage would fight. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, a couple things. All it was missing was <laughs> Hell in a Cell. Right. First of all, oh my god, Halloween Havoc sounds awful. What are you talking about? There's a monster truck <laughs> We ranch. have been doing a <laughs> Brian and Vinny and Craig show in 1995 talking about how the main event of this show was a guy who never had a match doing a monster truck match and then a match. Yeah. And the undercard featured Kamala, Meng, and if we were lucky, Lex Luger twice. We would not be happy. If we were lucky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Luger started to say, wait a minute now, I'm not down with this idea. Luger, by the way, I don't know how this is possible, but he found a suit jacket that was way too broad for him, which is amazing if you think about it. I got it from uh, Mark Henry. The giant. I guess, yeah. So Luger says this is a bad idea. Sting starts to bury him, saying Luger is disgusting. He's tired of sticking up for Luger and babysitting him. And Luger finally bows to peer pressure and accepts the challenge. And that's that. And then Okerlund said, and this is a quote, at Halloween Havoc, hopefully it'll be Luger against Savage if they win. Yeah. What a strange build for a pay-per-view. I just love this thing is burying Luger because Luger won't agree to face Meng and Savage on the same night. Yeah. What a dick. <laughs> yes. So, to summarize... <laughs> Sting's plan to make Randy Savage and Lex Luger be friends to bring peace to bring peace mm -hmm. is that they should fight. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> that's his plan. That That's his plan. What I loved about this is Sting was so passionate and in Luger's face every time he would he, he would make a statement and he would be yelling and screaming and Luger's hair would subtly move with each <laughs> breath. <laughs> 
It is overly processed is, yeah. I think, the term that they use in that industry. But, yeah. They made a big show of uh, a limousine pulling up to WCW offices, and, yes, Chris Benoit arrived in his suit and his mullet. And, uh, yeah, I didn't. I, in hindsight, I did not realize he had showed up this early in Nitro. These shows are about to get a lot less fun. Hey, well, next week it's uh, Benoit Guerrero. Yeah. And if I recall correctly, I could be wrong, but there was a Benoit Guerrero match, and I think it's next week, where Chris Benoit gave Eddie Guerrero the hardest powerbomb I have ever, ever, ever seen in my life. I remember I was watching it in my apartment in uh, Bothell, and it was uh, me and some buddies from high school. I think Tony was on the couch. And he, of course, didn't like wrestling. And my buddies from high school didn't like wrestling. And Benoit gives his dude the power bomb, And everyone at the same time, like, did a flip. And they were like, oh, my God, do you have this on tape? And they made me go back and rewind it during the commercial break, like, a hundred times. It was... So unbelievably brutal. And I think that's the one that's coming up next week. And by the way, Chris Benoit. Not a guy living in a fucking one-bedroom apartment trying to make ends meet. Playing video games. They made it out like this guy was a star. Mm -hmm. Shows up in a limo. He's got a suit jacket on. Made him seem like a big deal. Big superstar from Japan. Exactly. One, everybody everybody who's got a job wrestling on television every week should be should be making money in storyline. Yes. Right. Not in poverty. Yeah. I firmly believe this with all my heart. So anyway. Uh Disco Inferno came out to dance on the stage. He was interrupted by Big Bubba's music. So they started playing Big, Bu- Big Bubba's music, and Disco picked up his boombox and started playing his own theme. All wrestlers just actually have their theme playing at all times on their cell phone ring and all that stuff, yeah. So uh, Bubba looked at him, but decided this goof was not worth his time and moved on. Then Road Warrior Hawk came out. And he scared Disco away, but Disco returned, and he got revenge. He stole a fan's hat and hung it on Hawk's shoulder pad spike. Ha-ha! Wow. Clever. <laughs> That's original. Man. <laughs> that was original. So Hawk noticed this by the time he got to the ring and was annoyed. They wrestled a few minutes, and then Disco came out on the apron, and Hawk went after him and beat him up and tore his fancy shirt up, and he was so busy beating Disco up, he got countered out. Yes, a distraction finish. Hey, at least they had a bunch of different finishes on this show. I suppose. I love Bobby was talking about his shirt from as soon as he came out. Wow, look at that shirt. And, of course, McMichael not being clued in. It's probably Rayon. Yeah. No, no, it's Silk. It's from <laughs> it's from Italy. <laughs> look at that thing. No, it's Rayon. Oh, God. What I liked about this was, was awful. Bubba, Big Bubba. That's another guy that, in hindsight, way better than I remember. Man, what? And keep in mind, he's working with Hawk. Yeah, it's hard to have a tougher opponent than that. And man, he threw all these. He he was throwing the best right hands. I thought he was great. And then Disco going out there and overselling like a crazy man. <laughs> they threw his head into the yeah rail and he jumped five feet in the air. They're gonna hand flipped bump. around. Yeah. I guess if you're selling for Hawk, you better sell a lot or he's gonna hit you really hard. And then we had another to the back. Went to the back. Actually, it's back to the ring. But uh, Oakland brought out Hulk Hogan for a promo. A week had gone by since they had the heels had committed the dastardly sin of shaving off Hulk Hogan's mustache. Mm-hmm. And somehow Hogan was still clean shaven. He did not just grow the mustache back. Well, you know, in wrestling, it's, it takes a lot to grow your hair out, you know. So this was, I believe. The you forgot day- the most important part. Mm-hmm. He's still in a neck brace. Well, a black one at that. Yes, it was, this is Dark Side Hogan. He's still hurt three weeks later. More than that, I think. I think it's three weeks because Havoc's still like two weeks away. Yeah. Well, he also got hurt, like, re hurt the week before. Uh, well, that is true, yes. Yeah. So he's dressed all in black, head to toe. People booing. Custom black neck brace. He was booed. 
He dared the giant to come out and fight. Oakland said there's a restraining order. Giant's been barred from the building. So Hogan, I don't know what got, uh, I don't know what spurred this, but Hogan went off on a rant about working in New York where the promoter's ego started to get bigger than the business. So Hogan had to find a place where his Hulkamaniacs could grow. Grow? That's what he said. That's what he said. I was more fixated on him talking about how burning or shaving his mustache, yes. he equated that with burning the American flag. He said that. And even Gene He's was like, like no, it's not. what? The fuck are you talking about? And then he said something about he was he was immortal, and so he was going to go beat up Gorgeous George in heaven. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what happened. We got in Hulk it Hogan. Literally here. killed him to have his mustache shaven. I guess so. Yeah. What so does the Gorgeous George have to do with anything? I don't know. So then sirens started to blare. They cut to the back, where the giant in his monster truck came roaring through the parking lot and attempted to storm the building. Was I the only one that was just so amused by this? I could not take my eyes off of uh, Brutus. Brutus, the, the Zodiac. Zodiac. Yeah, I he actually his hands up, and he's. I actually remembered all, this uh, this shot here twenty years later, almost. And uh, yeah, the, the 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 monster truck, and it was roaring. It was moving. <laughs> oh yeah, it was. Big, a big Show one. was driving this truck. He had he had places to go, and uh, Zodiac's in the back, hanging on for dear life, no doubt, waving one arm in the air. He's it was doing- a hell of a visual. Yeah, and then uh, and then Hogan's like he's demanding they let the monster truck go to the ring. It's like, did you see the size of this truck? This truck ain't going nowhere. And then I think it was Bobby claiming that the tires on it were twenty five feet tall. <laughs> ben, I don't know. Twenty five feet. I, I know. For well, fact, you know, he's, they were not uh, twenty five feet tall. Re- I'm sure in wrestling uh, terms they were twenty five feet tall, but yeah. So man, what a truck! That's twice. I don't even like trucks. You know I was the, like, I can't wait to see this monster truck battle. You know the cage that they put up was fifteen feet. Well, you know it was ten <laughs> feet a, taller than that cage. Dude, I didn't see the truck next to the cage, so I cannot confirm. <laughs> if this is the anything case, here, Brutus Beefcake is exactly seven hundred pounds. Yeah, fuck, he may be. So when they uh, told Hulk they would not let the giant in, he said, "I'm going to go outside and get him." And we never saw him again. No, they, they, we were just told that police were keeping this separate, and that was that. Yeah, no follow-up. That was, that was disappointing. The, Part of this is because, like I said, I never saw the monster truck battle at Halloween Havoc. This is all new to me. How did you not see this? I don't know. I was somewhere. But I remember, because <laughs> I, I think I got reports from you, and you were like, oh, my God, Barry. They just did an <laughs> angle where they threw the giant off Kobo Hall. And yeah. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? And then he, like, came to the ring dry right after he'd been thrown into a lake off Kobo Hall, which by the way is nowhere near a lake. Yeah. That's an important detail. Spoilers, dude. It's like blocks away. Maybe still put few, his arms out and still, soared to a nearby a lake. I'm not quite away. sure. Or they should have had should have had like Kevin Sullivan had put like a bucket of water out underneath Kobo Hall that he fell into. <laughs> you know, like a little kiddie pool. This is like Bugs Bunny and Elmer Yeah, Fudd. exactly. High like dive. the Brian and Vinny battle. I see. Take a bump into a kiddie pool. Off Kobo Hall. Exactly, yeah. This sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> so does a monster truck battle on top of Kobo Hall. Especially when they're 25 feet at the tire. How do they get him up there? I can't wait for this pay-per-view. They probably just, just lifted it up there. He probably just <laughs> a took helicopter? a bump. Yeah. The tires are 25 feet tall. Right, he probably just drove up on top of the building. This pay-per-view is going to be awesome. You're going to make us watch it, aren't you? Well, we're for sure watching the monster truck battle and probably the main I'm event. not watching Randy Savage and Kamala. <laughs> <laughs> what and are it, you talking and I've about? I've already seen Lex Luger versus Meg, and it sucked the oh, first time. Oh, man. I don't want to watch it either, so okay. you're lucky. So speaking of Halloween Havoc, they re-aired the same uh, video they aired last week with the morphing graphic. Yes. Where mm-hmm. Giant turns mm-hmm. into the truck. What did it say? Mach- tr- the mach- man becomes man. the monster, and the monster becomes the man. That's right. That's machine. right. Monster. Maybe a machine. But anyway. uh, Whatever. I didn't notice this last week, but... You have Hulk Hogan and you have the the mysterious giant, they're calling him. The whole point of this guy is that all we know about him is that he is big. And that he's Andre's son, which seems to me to be a lot of information about the guy. Well, sure, but uh, then here in the graphic, Hulk Hogan is much taller than the giant. He killed the gimmick. Eh, well, you know. It's a funny, Craig. (laughs) Just, 
if it's Hogan's ego they put up there, then yes, it is much, much larger. Yeah. Yeah. But I just, I also had the visual of the man morphing into the monster into the machine. and then back. It's ridiculous. Can't wait for this pay per view. It's going to be awesome. So the main event was Ric Flair versus Arn Anderson in the cage match. He uh, wrestled about two minutes before going to commercial. When they came back, they had a spot to show on replay. Mm-hmm. And the spot was Arn Anderson falling onto his nuts on the ropes. Mm-hmm. They showed this several times from multiple angles in slow motion. Like it was a shooting star press or something. Hey, back in 95, you I know. I laughed. I don't know. They threw each other in the cage for a while. The crowd demanded blood. I didn't get it. Eventually, Brian Pillman tried to ran. He ran down and tried to climb over the cage, but Flair was there to fight him off and knock him down to the floor. And then Flair went for the figure four. And while he was doing this, Arn punched him, and he covered Flair, and the ref counted three. Yeah. And I was bewildered. Yeah. And then they showed a replay, and Arn Anderson had been so sneaky about getting a weapon and brass knuckles out that no one at home had noticed. So what happens when you don't clue in the announce team? Well, no, the announce team. And the cameraman. The, the announce team quickly did figure out what was going on. But what was amazing to me was like, hold I, on, I hold on. Why didn't they call attention to it when it was happening? Because they were talking about something else. Why didn't the director get a close up of it? Listen, you fuckers. I don't know. <laughs> but my point is, as I was trying to say before I was interrupted here, when I watched it, I didn't know it was brass knuckles either. So the announcers explain everything, and they show a replay, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's all great for us at home. But what about the mm. 8,000 people in the building <laughs> Don't know. who have no idea what's going on? Because Arn Anderson did not do it the old school way, where you stand up and you dramatically put the thing on your fingers. Yeah, you dramatically reach in your yes. trunks or whatever. He was just flares putting on a figure four, and he gets punched and pinned after, I might add, dominating the entire match from start to finish. Pretty much. Yeah. So that this, was a uh, fail. This weapon shot was so violent and brutal that Ric Flair stormed the announce desk for a promo. Oh, yeah, totally fine. And by the way, uh, everything was rushed on the show Yeah, until right here, where they had like three minutes of airtime to kill. <laughs> well, yeah, they... Uh... So Flair came out, and he demanded a handicap match against Pillman and Anderson so he could get, him both, get his hands on both of them at once. And he left, and he then ranted about Hogan for a while, and then Bischoff repeated everything Flair had said, and... The crowd chanted that Hogan sucked again, and they discussed the Havoc card, and Mongo said, there's so much going on at Halloween Havoc, you can't help but pay per for view that thing. <laughs> oh, Mongo's terrible at his job. <laughs> Just terrible. And then they plug next week, DDP versus Johnny V. Bad. I believe those two wrestled a billion times. Yeah. Uh, Chris Benoit versus Eddie Guerrero, who may have also wrestled a billion times, actually, but they were all good. Yep. And Hacksaw Duggan versus Ming. A giant hog. <laughs> the hog. And that was Nitro. And then Flair and Anderson against Pillman and a partner. And I am fully expecting a horseman beatdown. Mm. And if I don't get it, I'm going to be pissed off. I think I think next week's the handicap match. It's still building to the tag match. I see. That, that's I down see. the road. Yeah, I, I'm not, trying not to give myself spoilers from 1995. Yeah. Let's go to Nitro, Vinny. Let's move on. All right. So, Nitro, the uh, last week's episode had uh, ended with Ric Flair declaring he would fight Arn Anderson and Pillman by, Brian Pillman by himself if he had to. So and here, his word. Here they showed a clip from a program called WCW Pro. That was a Sunday show, if I recall correctly. Which is apparently the whole name of the show, just Pro. So here, I actually remember this. They, didn't, they did not do a good job recapping this. But Ric Flair was so desperate for Sting to be his tag team partner... That he brought out children to the ring, like a dozen kids in sting face paint, a dozen <laughs> little stingers. That's the goddamn creepiest thing. <laughs> and he surrounded himself, and he had all these kids begging Sting to team with Flair. Flair could not deny little stingers. He finally agreed to be Flair's uh, uh, partner. Sting but... could not deny little stingers. What did I say? Flair. Uh, yeah. So uh, he said if Flair swerved him, he would leave him for dead. Yeah, a bunch of little kids there with sting masks, and, and Sting is threatening to kill Ric Flair. Well, leave him for dead. I will kill you. So the opener here on Nitro was Diamond Dallas Page versus Johnny B. Bad. Yeah. I started to get annoyed here. In fact, I was very annoyed at one point, and then was very happy by the end of this. 
first of all, they showed the interview in uh, from Saturday night where Johnny was uh, delayed due to transportation issues and thus missed a title match. And Paige was mocking him about how he had four flat tires. And Johnny said, how did you know I had four? I only said one. And he punched him in the face. Ah. Classic angle. Classic yeah. angle. So here they're about to have this match. I'll tell you why that's classic. Because in this match here, before it began, Diamond Dallas Page hit him with the belt and got DQ'd immediately. So he did not have to fight a title match, correct? I suppose so, yeah. So if it's that easy, why did you go to all the fucking trouble of finding his car and popping all four tires? He's a dick. Just hit him with a belt. Just wanted to leave him stranded somewhere. I see. Give him a tow truck belt. I guess in 95, that was difficult to get uh, no cell phones. Had to walk to the nearest. Uh... Yeah. So more importantly, as Paige is coming out here, Eric Bischoff lets us know that no matter what happens in this match, these two will still wrestle each other on the pay-per-view. Yeah. This may have been a historic first where an answer outright said that nothing in this match matters. The results well, of this are irrelevant. Kind of. I mean, if, if there had been a title change, it would have done a rematch on the pay-per-view. It wasn't necessarily saying it doesn't matter. I mean, it would have mattered if the title changed hands, but... Why? I don't know. I, I can win it back in two weeks. Who he cares? He could, but that doesn't mean he's going... It's not like having a match where if he wins, he doesn't get the title. It doesn't matter. Wait, what? The point of this is that uh, Johnny B. Bad was hurt. That's why they didn't do a match. Yes, by the end of this. Because, you see, before the match began... Page hit Bad in the back of the head with his belt. And Johnny B. Bad sold this like death. Mm -hmm. Collapsed, unmoving. And then they rang the bell and announced Page was disqualified. Logic! Hooray! Yeah. That made me so happy. Bad ribs, actually, is what he actually had. Who? Page? Uh, Johnny B. Bad. No. Page had bad ribs for like a year. So, yeah, this was a terrible opening segment, but at least they didn't like continue the match after the pre bell attack. And we got to see Kimberly. True. Yeah, we did. Kimberly very, Page. Very attractive woman. All right. We must now discuss Eddie Guerrero versus Chris Benoit. Before this began, I thought this is going to be great and depressing. I was well, correct on both counts. Let's be journalists here. All right. Let's just uh, let's just talk the facts. All right. Let's not worry about uh, anything else. That's all this review the is. The fact is it was depressing. Well, it was depressing, but... So, as a wrestling match, mm -hmm. holy shit. Tremendous. What a match. My yeah. God. Both guys. Yes. Uh, Eddie did fuck up a 619, yeah. but you can't win them all. Uh, the one thing about Benoit, I mean, whatever, you know, everyone knows what happened, but it would be foolish to, as a result of what happened. And listen, I knew the guy. He was, I, I don't want to say he was like a buddy of mine, but I did talk to him fairly regularly, and I was as shocked as anybody with what happened. It would be foolish, knowing what happened, to go back and all of a sudden claim he was not a good wrestler. Of course. Ridiculous. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about, as a wrestler, what was great about Chris Benoit. And if you are a wrestler and you want to, I don't know, find out some of the things that he did that were great so that maybe you can do them, the good stuff, obviously, uh, here are some things. This guy, in 1995, the thing I noticed about Chris Benoit was that Every single thing he did was about, I got to make it look real. Yeah. There was no show. There was, and, and it really struck me when he would body slam Eddie Guerrero. This was not where you lift the guy up and you hold him upside down and you pause for a moment and then you slam him to the ground. This was, I'm going to grab you in a, in a, uh, what, what, what do they call the actual term? Like a collar and a high crotch or something like that. Whatever they call it. Yeah. And I'm just going to flip you the fuck over and slam you onto the ground. That's what he did. Every single move he did was just, if this were real, yes. what would it look like if I really did this? But he still, it's not like a, a match where, I mean, you can have guys do that and it looks terrible. But he also, uh, the big heat spot was Eddie Guerrero uh, slammed his uh, arm and shoulder into the ring post. And so what did Chris Benoit do? He worked over his arm and shoulder the entire match. And at the end of the match, Eddie Guerrero throws one punch. It's his bad shoulder. He sells the shoulder, and then Chris Benoit dragon suplexes him and pins him. There was psychology. There was athleticism. There was realism. And it was just funny to watch this and think that in the year 2000, 
when Chris Benoit went to WWE, WWF, and he had that match with Hunter, and they went backstage afterwards, and what did Hunter tell people? This guy can be carried. Horseshit. Eddie, Eddie Guerrero, holy smokes, what a baby face. Uh, he was awesome. I mean, and then there was the power bomb. You warned us about this. I warned you about this. It was and not sufficient. When I watched this power bomb again, I rewound this power bomb like nine million times when I saw it live. And so, of course, when I saw it again, it was like all of these memories come rushing back to me. Everything that I remembered about it, just how hardy power bomb this guy. And most of all, when he power bombed this guy, and like a lot of the crowd was paying attention because it was a good match. But he power bombed this guy, and you can just look at the crowd, and everybody in the crowd just their eyes grow wide and their mouth is agape, and they all of a sudden just turn and they look at each other like, Oh my god, did you see that? And Wow. All three announcers went berserk. Oh, my Cannot God. Cannot believe what they had just seen. You made a point at, at our Bound for Glory review about how Tommy Dreamer and Bubba Ray were best friends. And they started throwing each other in tacks later, and you couldn't understand how friends could do this. Yeah. Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit were good friends. Oh, yeah. And uh, they did this powerbomb here. And I, I'll say this to you guys. As, as friends of mine, I would rather you put me in a tax than powerbomb me like this. For the record. That's fair. That's fair. I'll remember that. Yeah. Okay. I also I can't lift you, so I don't only I only have one other option. <laughs> Throw your ass in the golden tax. Apparently. Also, Bobby Heenan in one of his all time great lines declared that Dennis Robin just rebounded Eddie's head. Yeah. That was yeah. tremendous. That's good. Eddie's one armed comeback was fantastic. And then he threw this amazing punch. And then sold his arm, and yes, got dragon suplexed and pinned. And uh, yeah, as a match, this was excellent. As a reviewer, I was queasy. Well, yeah, and I, I got to say, too, I, I, I don't want to talk too much about uh, what happened in the end. If we're going to be watching this show every week, it's probably going to get old hearing us talk about it every week. Well, hey, let's get it out of the way right now. I'll you just know? say this. You know, I never saw it coming. Never. Not in a million years. You talk to this guy on the phone, he was like... He was, I don't even know, like, he would ask me for advice. I'm like, yeah, the fuck? Are you asking me for advice? So, I never saw it coming, but I got to say that when I watched this match, guy kind of looked a little nuts, you know what I mean? He yeah. kind of had that look about him. And I, I, I do think that in the end, it was like, you know, all the concussions, just like all of these NFL players that go out of their minds and they have the same head issues, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a lot of concussions. It was a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, depression. I mean, there were a million things that contributed to this. But he did look like a guy that, he, uh, on top of everything else, he was a little bit out of his mind. Well, everybody in wrestling is a little bit out of their mind, let's be honest. I guess you're right. I mean, it takes a different breed of cat to do this. That is true. But uh, the match itself was absolutely tremendous. There was a uh, back suplex spot. And they both tumbled over the ropes to the floor. Mm, yep. Great dive by Eddie. Looked incredibly stiff. I mean, they just, he crashed into Benoit. Oh, yeah. And uh, the finish when Benoit hit the dragon suplex, it was so new. The announcers didn't even know what to call the move. Well, to be fair, they didn't know what to call most moves. But yes, <laughs> that is true. It just, uh, I watch Ring of Honor every week and I see these guys trying to emulate this style of match. And uh, they still can't do it. No, they, they tried to emulate the wrong stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff in this match that uh, th this was, this was kind of a spot fest. But only kind of. And it, this was a great professional wrestling match that just happened to have state-of-the-art moves at the time. It was not just, let's do as many moves as possible, and then someone will win after a bunch of near falls. And like I said, there was a psychology to the match that all built around the heat. The, the move during the heat that caused Eddie to get cut off ended up being his undoing in the end. It made perfect sense. They worked it over the whole time. It was it was great. It was a great wrestling match. 
Now let's move on. The problem, just real quick, the problem with people trying to emulate this and doing it wrong, you know they were emulating the wrong stuff. They tried to emulate the dragon suplex or the big dive or the violent power bomb. Emulate things like the stomps. Exactly. And the forearms. And Eddie Guerrero's selling. And Eddie Guerrero's selling. And yes. his facials and his and the fire. Pacing, yes. Yes. That's it's... that's the stuff to emulate to have a great match. And throw a couple of good moves in there and you're good to go. Yes. Emphasis on the selling, because yeah. I think people forgot how to do that. Yeah. Everywhere. So after this match Except Rusev. <laughs> actually actually you're right. I am right. <laughs> it's amazing. He's got the most amazing Jesus. facials. It's crazy. So, from there, Eric Bischoff said that we're going to start a cruiserweight division soon. You get all kinds of great matches like that. And then, like, without even stopping to breathe, he said, now let's talk about the giant. Yeah. Hey. That made me laugh. Moneymaker. Sure. By the way, we have in the past uh, six weeks, I guess, said many mean things about Steve McMichael. All is forgiven. Did you see his shirt? I did not. Oh, it was awesome. Black and silver and very fancy. He was he was way better this week than he was any previous week. So I, there was nothing that really annoyed me, except his dog. I could do without the dog. So then, Mean Gene Okerlund stood in a w sub, WCW ring on live television and told us all to call his hotline for WWF news. Yeah, the departure of Bill Watts. Is that what it was? After a whopping three weeks in WWF, did he? Was that like his? Was the hotline Gene's personal business? Uh, no, but I know that he made, like, he, I, I think he got, like, a big cut of it. I see. So, you know, all, all of the guys, like, uh, you know, everybody had, uh, I mean, the company would make the, the bulk of the money, but everybody got paid based on how much revenue they drew. I don't know what the percentage was. Sure. But, uh, so, yeah, he was, he was really good at getting people to call the hotline. So, he called out Kevin Sullivan and The Giant, and these three guys standing in the ring, Kevin Sullivan, Gene Oakland, and The Giant... Giant looked at least 12 feet tall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just huge. And Gene is so perfect at every once in a while stopping. Well, he, Sullivan was talking. Gene was holding the mic. But he'd be looking at Sullivan, and he'd look back over his shoulder at Giant, and then his head would creak up and up and up and up. Yeah, and then just like he still, like he still couldn't believe how big this human being was. This is a prime. Back. This is a prime example of of how awesome Gene was. You know, I mentioned this on another show about how all of these guys, they're given scripts nowadays, they're told what to say, and they got to go out there and act. And they suck. And the real good ones, like uh, Dean Ambrose is great at doing this. Dean Ambrose just reacts to everything. And you, you look at him, and you can't not look at him, because you, you want to see how he's going to react to everything. That that's what's, That's great. And Gene Okerlund is a guy, every announcer today... Every announcer has one job. You look as generic as possible, and you say, my guest at this time, Craig Proper. And then they, the, the guy says a lot of stuff, and then you go, back to you, Cole, or whatever. If the announcer today just watched Gene Okerlund react to everything the bad guy said, and just did a little bit of that, they would be a million times better without having to say a word. It, it, it's just like... And the best part was the giant threatened to kill Hulk Hogan. He threatened to drive him off the roof of Kobo Hall. At which point, Gene had a look of abject horror. He turned, and his eyes grew wide, and he's like, Oh, my God. Like, he could not even believe a man would threaten to do this. And by the way, keep in mind, Hogan tried to do the same thing to the giant. But Gene's reactions to everything these heels were saying was so great. So, uh, Sull Sullivan... Rambled on a bit, said he was evil, but he knew Hogan was evil too. And they were going to turn all the Hulkamaniacs into children of the Dungeon of Doom. No, oh, no. <laughs> and then Giant actually cut a great promo about how his truck was going to push Hulk's truck all over Detroit. And then he was going to take Hogan's belt. God, Giant was so good. He is. He'd never even had a match at this point. He had never had a single wrestling match. I'm pretty sure if you lined up everyone... Who has ever wrestled a match before they started and lined them up and said, You can pick one of these guys to be in your the, the star of your company. Who do you want? I am pretty sure he would be the guy. 
Well, either him or uh, Kurt Angle. It would be close between those two. Angle was amazing about two weeks into the business. Yes. Let's see. Oh, uh, Disco came out to dance on stage. Yeah. Eric Bischoff said he was so sick of Disco, he was going to cough up his toenails. What? Yeah. I don't know. So, Mang interrupted Disco's dancing. And uh, unlike last week when Disco stayed there to make mean faces of Big Bubba, Disco got the hell out of Dodge. Not messing around with Ming. Why the hell can't Ming wear his hog head to the ring? I don't know. They've only showed it in the, the graphics. It's infuriating. So you got Ming versus Hacksaw Duggan. My announce, my uh, expectations for this were very low, but we actually had a decent little short, intense brawl. It was all right. It was mostly Ming. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So they punch each other a lot, and then Duggan took an awful bump for a super kick, and Ming applied the Asiatic spike, and he ref called for the bell. Ming, winner via ref stoppage. I just remember a couple of years earlier, they had that uh, Ming, or no, it was Hacksaw Duggan versus Shawn Michaels match on Raw that was just out of this world. <laughs> and then uh, here we are watching uh, him look not so good against Ming. Although Ming was very agile, shockingly agile. Yeah, the uh, kick to the face for the finish was, uh, was impressive. Yeah. Yeah. This match went under two minutes, and it had a certain charm to it that... Uh, it didn't bother me how... It's because it was only two minutes. If it would have gone five, you would have been... Yeah, uh, I'd probably be yelling. That's true. We got a backstage video promo by Darkseid Hulk Hogan. Oh, my God. This was amazing. This is so awesome. He referred to his Hulkamanioids, because Hulk I guess when he's wearing black, they're not Hulkamaniacs anymore. Hulkamanioids. Yeah, yeah. Said wow. Sullivan was right. He was evil. He claimed he could stop elephants in their tracks and make promoters cry. True. Jimmy One, Hart. Half of that. <laughs> the second half. Jimmy interrupted him, said he was worried about Hulk was, what Hulk was going to do to the giant when he got his hands on him. Hulk told him to stay out of this. He threatened to drag the giant's truck around with his bare hands. Yeah. Then press the giant over his head, beat him, bury him. Then he asked, what you going to do when the darkness and evil gouges you? Yeah. This was great. I got to say that I really loved it. Hulkamanioids, I laughed my ass off. He was completely, completely out of his mind. Uh, still wearing his neck brace. Uh, the only thing missing from this was if they had actually been animated. It was a <laughs> total cartoon promo. And and, and it, really, it was really hitting me here. Like last week, people were starting to boo Hulk Hogan. And what this was, was a 1980s cartoon in 1995. And, like, all of those little kids that grew up with Hulk Hogan in the 80s were now teenagers watching this goofy man rant and rave about a big, stinky giant and Hulkamanioids. Imagine if you were 10 in, like, 1988, and now you were, like... I, I was 12, yeah. Yeah, now, now you're, like, 17 here in 1995 or whatever the math would be. And here's this guy just being so wacky. No wonder everybody hated him. No wonder they all turned on him. It was completely out of place. Make sure you bring this up to Lance on uh, your guys' next show. He uh, he made sure to send me a message and said he loved the show, except all the Hulk Hogan stuff. Well, there you he go. It brought down the show. Wow. So, I uh, love the campiness of it, but I, I could totally understand why everybody was starting to turn on this guy. But you know what? I'm just tired At of seeing... At least he was wearing a neck brace. At least he it's was true. passionate. I'm so tired of seeing boring scripted promos by bad actors on Raw. Just give me a lunatic. He, hey, he was a lunatic, all right. He was an right. unmistakable lunatic here. Oh, yeah. Out of his mind. It's great. Main event was Brian Pillman and Arn Anderson versus Sting and Ric Flair. Got to hear the Four Horsemen theme song, the best song ever. And Sting did not come out with Flair. Flair came out on his own. But he was fine with this. He had no problem fighting these fuckers by himself. So Flair and Pillman started, and they just chopped the holy living hell out of each other. Flair at one point chopped Pillman so hard the ref fell down. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure who this ref was. Randy Anderson. It was Randy, Randy Anderson. Anderson. Okay, yeah. I did have a right guess. He was great. Oh yeah, he was awesome. God, he was awesome. I was gonna bring this up. There was a point where. Sting was, you know, running to each corner and doing the splash, and Anderson was keeping pace with him. Yes, he was running back and forth. It's amazing. I like, 
I'm not sure. I forget even when it was, but I think it was. I think when Sting got a hot tag, but everyone's running around bumping and throwing strikes and falling over their place, and he's just like doing circles along the outside. And when Art was in his way, he just leapfrogged him. Yeah, Randy Anderson was great. So Flair's out there by himself as he's chopping the bejesus out of Brian Pillman. It occurred to me, where did Flair? Uh, where did Flair train to throw chops? Like if you're a pro boxer. Well, be- I, I think the story was that he uh, he couldn't throw a punch. Okay. And so he started throwing chops because they looked better. That's fine. But you still had to train them somehow. Because if you're a pro boxer and you want to throw hard punches, you're going to spend a lot of time in the heavy bag. No, you want to know? Uh, I, I have the vision of Ric Flair chopping the hell out of heavy bag. You want to know how I train chops? How's that? I chop the wall. You have told me this, yes. Not even making this up. I used to chop the wall over and over again. And I could throw a chop. Sure. I, th- I think he just chopped like Wahoo McDaniel repeatedly. Well, <laughs> over and over again. That's actually a good point. He did work with Wahoo a lot. So, yes. Paid the price afterwards, yeah. yes. I'm sure. Yes. yes. That's I actually... loved, what I loved about this so much is, is if you've ever watched Ric Flair as a heel, you know how he does a match. He sells and sells and sells and sells. Cuts the guy off. The guy cuts him right back off. And he sells and he, he gives the guy like 90% of the match. Well, here's a baby face. He did the exact opposite. Yes. He ran the fuck wild on both of these guys. Yes. He beat them both from pillar to post repeatedly over and over. Every time somebody got something on, he cut him right off and just kept beating them. And he beat him and he beat him and he beat him until finally he got cut off with a spine buster. Yes. I was like, he's doing his own match, just he's playing the other role. Yeah. And it was great. It was great. So they're doing this and the crowd is chanting, we want Sting. And then, as you noted, finally, Flair's running the ropes, and Pillman hit a kick to the back as he ran, and Arn cut him off with a spine buster, and he's finally in trouble. And at this point, Sting made his entrance. Now, talked about what a boring, lifeless, dead show Monday Night Raw was. Mm Mm-hmm. This place went nuts. Oh, yeah. This place lost their goddamn minds when Sting ran down and jumped on the apron. Oh, yeah. I know... Voting for the Hall of Fame is closed. I was thinking the exact same thing. I know Sting is a hot-button candidate. Is that the term? Sure. He's a, he's a, controversial. A of, controversial. A lot of supporters, a lot of deniers. Yes. I believe that Sting's complete resume for getting into the Hall of Fame is on this, the October 16th, 1995 <laughs> episode of Monday uh, Nitro. He got an amazing pop. Done. Hall of Famer. Well, you know, I got to say that that uh, every time the Sting's name comes up, one of the main arguments, because when you look at the Hall of Fame qualifications, there are a lot of ways that he really doesn't qualify. But the one thing that people always bring up is it's Sting. How do you have a Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame with no Sting? That's like the best argument that people come up with. And I just got to say, when I watched this show and I watched this guy come down and the crowd reacting to him, it was one of those things where it's like, how is this fucker not in the Hall of Fame? Yes. Look at this. It's ridiculous. So, he came out, Flair was in trouble, he crawled for the hot tag, the announcers were wondering if they would actually be on the same page, and Flair tagged him and Sting came in, and everyone screamed with glee and jumped up and down, Sting ran wild, hit a bunch of slams and a bunch of face busters and a bunch of stinger splashes, and then the heels rolled outside, and Sting and Flair had their moment where they looked each other in the eye and they came to an agreement. And then the ref just started waving his hands, and the announcer said, it's count out. Yep. <laughs> there was no bell. This finish was bad. So their, the finish was a count out as the heels took their uh, loss rather than get beat up by Sting anymore. And as they're walking to the back, <laughs> Arn Anderson, my favorite wrestler maybe, holds his hands out in front of him, looks to the skies above as if to ask, why, God, did that go so wrong? Why did that go so badly for us? As I noted earlier, when uh, walked in the room, you were still watching us, Brian. This is the second week in a row, the announcers had no idea that the match had finished. Last week, it was Arn with the Nux. That's this right. This week, it was the countout. And they yeah. had no idea what was going on. 
Well, I think I think last week they did know what was going on, but they were they were they were trying to get over the idea that what the hell happened right there, and then they had to explain that he was using Nux because he didn't make it obvious. Uh, this one, they were just busy bebopping. Yeah, <laughs> they weren't well, paying attention. They they weren't paying attention. The uh, camera was showing Sting and Flair, and not the guys getting counted out or the ref counting. There was no bell. A lot went wrong here. Yeah. So they went to commercial. And they came back. Oakland was interviewing Sting. And this is actually amazing. Sting says nobody in the world thought he could trust Flair. So he had to hide in the back and watch the monitor and see what Flair did on his own. Noted Flair had a lot of guts. And he was sure to point out that he ran out before things got too far. And now that Sting knew that Flair was willing to fight on his own, he knew Flair was walking the straight and narrow. He knew they would get the win at Halloween Havoc. And Flair was happy. And everyone was cheering. Meanwhile, the announcers are constantly muttering themselves like, well, it was it was Bobby. He was shocked, speechless, and utterly disappointed at Ric Flair for this. Could not even believe I, this. I, it came off like okay, but yeah, it was very hard to hear, and they well, came I, off like they were just muttering. I, I, I interpreted it actually exactly the wrong way. I heard lots of I can't believe this. He's delusional. This doesn't make any sense. I thought they were saying Sting was being an idiot for trusting Flair. Well, that might have been a little bit of it too, because. Uh, you know, at the time that they were doing this, the idea was it was going to be a big horseman beatdown on Sting yes. at Halloween Havoc. And Sting was in the midst of, of putting the Ixnay on it because he didn't want to look like an idiot. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> so for next week, they plugged Sting and Luler versus Harlem Heat. Benoit and Dean Malenko versus Eddie Guerrero and Alex Wright. And an appearance by Hulk Hogan. And this is still the best show we review every week. And, and and you'll note that next week Hulk Hogan will be there because he has not been on the show in a while. Because he was a big star and he didn't have to be there every single solitary week. At least at the time. That would change. Yes, Greg? I have nothing more to add, actually. Hmm. Great show. I love this show. It was, show it was awesome. fun. Yeah, we'll see what happens uh, on next week's show. So with that history lesson out of the way... Let's go to uh, Nitro for more history. This is, this is even even older history. This is October 23rd, 1995, the go-home show for Halloween Havoc. You know we got to watch the main event for next oh, week. Hell yeah. Craig, how can you not be excited? It's monster trucks. Okay. Yeah. Brian, I know you've said you never saw the monster truck match. That's right. So I'm assuming you never saw the actual match itself. I never saw this pay-per-view. Most importantly... I didn't write this chapter, just so everybody's aware. Have you <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the post match? Are you talking about the humping? I am. I have. All right, just making sure. Oh yeah, I'm actually. Craig, sad. do you know what we're talking about? No, but Ed alerted me. He said, "Is this where Ed the, would know the Yeti and I can't remember the other guy went DP on Hogan?" Wow. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ed. That's not how I would phrase it, but uh, he is not inaccurate here. <laughs> I see. <laughs> the answer is yes, but... That's exactly what happened, actually. All right, so uh, that was not on this show. And over the Randy Savage versus Kurosawa. Now, I could be wrong here about this match, but um, I don't know when it was. It may have been the pre-show. I think it was a pre-show, actually, for World War Three. But the very famous, at least among our readership, incident where Hulk Hogan burned a copy of The Observer... Mm -hmm. And he said, observe this. And he's ranting and raving about how it, the dirt sheets had reported that Randy Savage had an arm injury. Yes. Randy Savage is here with an arm injury. Yeah. Right. As acknowledged by Eric Bischoff. And we're, yes. And in fact, on the same show that Hogan burned the observer for the inaccurate report, Randy Savage came out with his arm taped up and that played into the finish of the match. Yes. Classic. So, uh, Eric Bischoff here was in full back leg round kick mode. Oh, my God. <laughs> One after another. So, the match is very simple. Kurosawa beat the fuck out of him. Kicked him. Clobbered him. Every once in a while, hit a throw, and then go back to kicking and clobbering. Savage sold the entire time like he was near death. Then Savage hit one rabbit lariat and the top row elbow for the win. That's what happened. That is the whole match. And I thought that it was a uh, great performance by Randy Savage. Yes. Every time he fired up, the place just went absolutely crazy. And he won the match. His, his selling was great. And you know what's funny about this? Tells you how times have changed. Dave gave this minus a star and a quarter. Jesus Christ. I don't know where he got the quarter. 
but he said it was a worst match of the year candidate. Wow. I don't think it was the worst match in the show. Think about that. I actually liked it a lot just because even as Kurosawa was beating on him, it never felt like a guy who was A, trying to get all the shit in, or B, just killing time until Savage hit the big moves, which is what most matches are these days. We talked about the formula. This felt like a big, scary Japanese guy who's fighting a crazy American dude and beating the fuck out of him so he could kill him. And the end, he came up short. I was just surprised at how much of the match Kurosawa actually took. And he was kicking Savage really hard. And uh, there was a spot where uh, Kurosawa got bumped to the outside. And he was like on his back and then slid. And he fell from apron height straight down to the floor. And uh, it looked like it really, really sucked. But um, yeah, it was a fun match. The announcers were then running down the show when the arena went dark. Oh, this. Curtis Iakea in wacky makeup appeared on the big screen in his throne from the Dungeon of Doom's lair. He started raving, and I understood perhaps 10% of it. It wasn't just you. Oh, man, I understood all of it. What? He, uh, first off, he's Kevin Sullivan's father. He founded the Dungeon of Doom. He went to... Well, he didn't say where. All of it. I, you know, he said the Himalayas. Himalayas with Sherpas. They find Sanjay Dutt. To get the Yeti. No. <laughs> which, by the way, I don't know if Dave was the only one that spelled it wrong and then it caught on. <laughs> or if WCW like also spelled it wrong. I know Dave spelled it wrong in The Observer. But... Uh, no, they, they all pronounce it Yeti. Well, as I, actually, believe it or not. Uh-oh. That is the proper pronunciation. Yeti. Because it's spelled Y E H dash T E H. Us Americans decided to spell it Y E T I. Except mm. Dave added two T's. <laughs> but they went to get the Yete. And Sullivan played Paul Heyman. And he said he knew there was evil in Hulk Hogan's heart. Yes. And he was right. So, yes, uh, the, the, what do they call him, the gatekeeper, King Curtis, he rambled on for a while. And they wheeled out a large block of styrofoam that was supposed to be ice. You guys saw what happened at the end, right? It was yeah. loose side, actually. Okay, I don't know if it was just at the end or if it was throughout the entire show, but the there's a block of ice and there's a shadow. Yes. Inside the ice? Looked like a giant cock. Is that the only one? Yep. You're the if you only watch one. it again. <laughs> no. If you watch it again, it's unmistakable. Not it reminded me of the pad on the Big Lebowski that he <clears throat> drew in with the pencil. Yeah. Yes. No, I did not see that. So they interviewed uh, Gene Orkland interviewed Sullivan and the Giant with a block of ice in the background. And Sullivan explained that it was the Yete, which was their insurance policy. The giant promised to take Hogan's life and his title. His life. Yeah. And, uh, it was all, obviously, as it sounds, very, very, very silly, but somehow appropriate for a show called Halloween Havoc. Yeah, what the hell do you guys want? It's Halloween Havoc. Vinny, you used to work for a hunting and fishing magazine, correct? Correct. When folks would take pictures of their fish that they caught, mm -hmm. do you know the pose that these men would use? The name of the pose? I'm not sure that the name. Actually, just if you know the is. name of the pose, I would like to uh, hear it. They actually call it when you... Grab the, uh, you know, you're holding up your fish for the camera, mm -hmm. showing off your, uh, your your trophy and being proud of it. We called it the grip and grin. Okay, but even more than that. Wow. <laughs> Don't let more, Ed know that. Even more than that, when they take oh, the hold picture. Hold on a second. The grip and grin? Yeah, you grip your fish and you grin. That's really what they called it? Yes. And you published this in the magazine? No. Okay. <laughs> this was an inside. Yes. Okay. Holy God. Go ahead, Craig. Anyway, what most people do is they strategically hold the fish farther away from them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the fish looks very, very large. Yes, yes. Uh, depth perception trick. Yes, sir. I couldn't help but notice that Gene was doing the interview from behind the giant. Yes. And Kevin Sullivan behind him. The giant looked massive. Oh, yeah. I think they may have also been downstairs from him. <laughs> well, they're also about 5'5". Five, five. They've done it in the ring, so and they still helps. look tiny, but yes. They, yeah. they, they, were, they were doing everything they could to make him look as big as possible. So you're, telling me they were doing, them. you're telling me that, that Gene Oakland was doing the grip and grin with the giant? That's not what I'm telling you, Brian. 
He wasn't grinning. Because that is unacceptable. He was not grinning. Actually, he was grinning a lot. Or no, maybe that was with Hulk later. Yeah. It's just Sorry. funny. Giant was just right in front of the camera, and when he would, you know, clasp his hands together and rub them together maniacally, they look so massive on the screen. Yeah. Well, they are. It's just he's a big guy. It's just they they knew what they were doing with the guy. Yes, they did. After commercial, Oakland brought Hulk Hogan out for a promo. First, what I- a show so far, by the way. Jesus. Yeah. He first identified him as the star of Thunder in Paradise, and then as the world heavyweight champion. His mustache still has not grown back yet. No, no. He said, this is a direct quote, Though I walk through the valley of the Dungeon of Doom, brother, I fear no evil, dude. (laughs) That's funny you mentioned that. Whitney walked in right when Hulk Hogan starts doing his interview, and she doesn't remember Red and Yellow Hogan. When she was a little kid, it was, uh, and she didn't watch wrestling, but, you know, it was really popular, so you couldn't help but see it here and there. She remembered the, you know, bad guy Hulk Hogan. So she walks in, and there's Hogan in all black. She's like, oh, I remember this guy. Well, she knows Hulk Hogan. But anyway, she walks in, and he starts doing the promo, and when he said that line that you just said, she started howling yeah. at, this, at this line. And you know what? She stayed and watched the entire interview, and then when, like, Benoit came on the screen, she was out of here. But the point of this was, <laughs> he is such a compelling character. You know what I mean? You cannot help but yeah. watch this guy. Yes. Yeah. You cannot tear your eyes off the screen as he's going out of his mind. He was completely crazy in this promo. I'll say. <laughs> I don't like, even know what the hell he was talking like about. Even he's... by the standards of Hulk Hogan, this is a bizarre, crazy, insane promo. And then he made a comment about his black gloves. Yes. And you know what will happen with black gloves. I believe course, he compared himself to O.J. Simpson. He compared himself to O.J. He was going to murder somebody. Face. Yeah. He then noted that Sting and Luger and Savage had all abandoned him, which I have no idea what he's talking about. No one had mentioned this ever once. Hogan does a lot of promos where I, I don't think anybody knows what he's talking no. about. He just starts talking and he goes into Hogan mode and he just says whatever's on his mind. Throws in Jack and brother. Every whatever now enters and his mind. And dude. And that was that. I thought this was even weirder than the giant promo, and the giant promo oh, yeah, was built sure. around the Yeti. This was way, way weirder than that uh, giant promo. Dean Malenko and Chris Benoit versus Eddie Guerrero and Mr. JL. So Mr. JL was subbing for Alex Wright. Alex Wright was not cleared to wrestle, so he comes out on crutches with a knee brace. And even though he was never, ever, ever going to be wrestling this match, he was still in trunks knee pads, boots, and a leather jacket with no shirt. Yeah. Pro wrestling, everyone. He uh, he had his knee blown out in a match with, of all people, Benoit, who he was out here opposing. Bummer. And they made no mention of it. <laughs> yeah. Is that the match where they had at the, uh, the World Wrestling Peace Festival? Like they had, you know what I'm talking about? I remember the Peace Festival. I thought it was... Uh, that was their opening match, was Alex Wright and Benoit. No, this was at a... I think this was a Saturday night taping. Okay. So, a couple of notes. First of all, obvious statement. 1995 Eddie Guerrero was so different from Latino Heat Eddie Guerrero. Oh, yeah. A completely different human being. Yeah, Peace Festival was in June. Yeah. So, they did a bunch of dives one of which Eric Bischoff described as a full-cork, high-flying, double-press body slam. I am not making that up. So they're doing this cruiserweight tag match, and they're flying around doing stuff and didn't get much of a reaction until the hot tag. And uh, they're talking about the cruiserweights and all the action, how great this is, and then they cut backstage where Scott Norton is brawling with the shark. This was the second time they had done this, and I could give them the benefit of the doubt the first time, But, man, second time, come on. I watched the the Monday Night War. Why? On the cruiserweights. Okay. The the flight of the cruiserweights on the network. Is that what it's called? Yeah. That's actually excellent. Yeah, and and, uh, it was very, very good. If uh, you haven't seen it, go go check it out. But um, I watched that before I watched Nitro. And it, it talks about how everybody was disgruntled. All the cruiserweights were disgruntled in WCW because they're being used. Improperly. I wonder why. And then and then I got to this and they, they cut in with the shark and Norton, which who who cares? 
And, uh, and this was like, what, the third cruiserweight match that they've had on Nitro, basically. Yeah. It started from the very beginning. The uh, the disrespect of the cruiserweights. Last yeah. week we were complaining about Hogan breaking yeah. in on the. Anyway, well, same storyline every time. So it's Hogan storyline. Yeah, they brought that up a lot. And uh, anyway, the uh, Monday Night War flight of the cruiserweight is very good. So check it out. Check it out. There you go. Nine 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 so, network. <laughs> so Malenka was running the ropes. Alex Wright tripped him with a crutch. And JL got the pin with the victory roll. And Mongo let everyone know, quote, that cripple out there did interfere with the match. Wow. So as Eddie was going up the ramp, Brian Pillman zoomed in out of nowhere and hit a DDT in the concrete and laughed and ran away. So I assume that was just to build to the tournament, which I guess happened. <laughs> I was so annoyed by the uh, back leg round kick bullshit here. <laughs> yeah. Struck me as a guy that... Uh, you know, Eric Bischoff had done a lot of karate, and so I guess he just wanted to tell the world how much he knew about karate, which was, it reminded me of, uh, I went to, uh, when I went to Hawaii the first time, I went and trained with this, uh, uh, he was a fifth degree black belt under Hicks and Gracie. Uh, Lemon was his name. He's just awesome. And it was the exact opposite of Bischoff, because Bischoff has to show you that he knows every single technical aspect of, of karate. And meanwhile, I'm watching this kid's class run by this fifth-degree black belt. And, and these little kids, he wants them to get in the guard, but he doesn't even use the word guard. He's like, put your legs around him! That's how he coached. Didn't even have a name for the guard. And I'm like, here's Bischoff having to tell me every single fucking name of a kick that there possibly is, ruining this match. Like, who cares about the back leg round kick? What does that even mean? As opposed to your front leg round kick? I suppose, actually, yes. I'm s drenched in sweat right now thinking about these back leg round kicks. Yeah. And well, it's really hot. Harlem Heat versus Sting and Lex Luger. Sting, as Hogan had noted, was in fact wearing red and yellow, and I believe he had actually grown a mustache. So the most uh, most of this match was Lex getting beaten up as Sherry admired Polaroids of herself and Colonel Parker. It was very boring. What a storyline added to the show. <laughs> it was very boring. And uh, keep in mind, this was to sell the possibility that the pay-per-view Lex Luger might wrestle twice. All I know about this match is, first off, you're watching Booker T, and what an athlete this guy is. Yep. He's just so athletic. And so then Booker T tags, or no, uh, Lex Luger tags in. And Lex Luger goes over, and he puts his back against the uh, turnbuckles. And then he puts his two hands on the top rope. Mm -hmm. And then he leaps up, and he sits on the top rope. And then he stands up, so he's standing on the middle of the, ro the middle rope, and he does a double sledge. Yes. How Dave gave the opening match minus star and a quarter, <laughs> yeah. and he didn't give this minus 10 stars for Lex Luger's double sledge. It was the worst. First off. How do you fuck up a double sledge? All you're doing is leaping in the air and hitting the guy with your fists. Mm -hmm. It's all you have to do. You don't even have to take a bump. Lex Luger made this look like it was the most physically <laughs> impressive or difficult feat that a man could possibly accomplish within a wrestling ring. It was such a great effort for him to pull this off. It looked horrible. And then they got the heat on him the whole time. Mm -hmm. Again, to build up two matches at Halloween Havoc. So, oh, I was just going to say, um, uh, my, uh, my son's still trying to figure out who everybody is. And now he's asking questions like, is he dead? Oh God. Wow. I, I know. But I said, Craig Howells. Was... There were a lot of deceased people here yes, on sir. the show, Craig. There've been more actually, but, but he's like, okay, who are the big black guys? I said, well, that's Stevie Ray. And that's Booker T. And he goes, Booker T. Yeah, that's Booker T. He says, Wow, that's Booker T, and he was so excited, uh. and uh, he's actually getting to see him wrestle because he's never actually seen Booker T wrestle. How's that possible? He's eight. I realize that, but Booker's wrestled within the last eight years. In TNA. Anyway. So. I guess that's it. <laughs> Sting eventually. <laughs> that's more to the story. Man of very few words. I see. Sting pinned Booker, actually, with a body press, and as soon as the ref counted three, Giant hit the ring. He grabbed Lex Luger and chokeslammed him. Remember that for next week's show. He grabbed Sting and chokeslammed him. 
Savage ran out and they had a face off. But then Hogan hit the ring and convinced Savage to leave. Savage left. Hogan and Giant had their brawl. Hogan hulked up, got some offense. Doug Dillinger's in there with a Billy Club. Yeah. <laughs> trying to break things up. Got to stop this craziness. Next thing you know, the lights start flashing in the arena. The announcers to go off about how the floor is shaking. Bobby Heenan just runs for his life. Should have kept running. <laughs> never come back. They cut to the block of ice. There is a small pyro burst from ice. And it explodes. <laughs> and for about three quarters of a second, you see a giant mummy. You know why, don't you? No. no I'll tell you why. Because the mummy was supposed to be Giant Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And something happened, and he couldn't make it into the country. Oh, but it was extremely important. <laughs> they have a mummy. To debut the Yeti, who I still have no fucking idea Do to they this know day, what a Yeti is? Why? Well, they must because, because well, maybe, I guess, Curtis IAK may be the only one that knows. Because he talked about going to the Himalayas with Sherpas. But yeah, you know, maybe, you know, it's possible. I, I could probably find out. I'll bet that the only reason they made him a mummy was because he wasn't there. Sure. And so they had to cover somebody up. Yeah. And so from that point forward, he had to be a mummy. Well, perhaps. All right. That's actually a better explanation than anything I can think of. Perhaps when they brought the Yeti down that he realized that he had hypothermia. And so they wrapped him up. Why didn't they just say he was an Egyptian mummy? Why did they call him the Yeti if they knew the guy wasn't there and they had to cover someone in toilet paper? Well, they, they had this the ice. block of ice. They couldn't let that go to waste. Uh, I, I you, guess, yeah, the Himalayas. You know how much lucite costs? How much does lucite cost? It's expensive. Is what it really? the fuck is lucite? That's what the block of ice was. How do you know that? Oh, God. Do we have to get into this? Actually, yeah. It could have been anything. No, it was lucite. Trust me. All right. Well, yeah, that was uh, the debut of the Yeti. And he's looking up Lucite, right? Now. Look it up, How Vinny, because I, I don't even know what it is either. Lucite I don't believe it exists. Cost. That's how much do Lucites cost? But I do have to say that uh, one thing about this was... Um, the first thing that comes up, by the way, the crazy cost of Lucite. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, they were spending a lot of money, so you must be right. You know, uh, Hogan was getting some booze when he ran in. But my God, people were still going crazy for this guy when he ran in to go face to face. And you know, Vinny, I thought the exact same thing you did when you were talking about how uh, Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose are together in the ring together. Like Hogan just comes down and he gets in the ring with the giant and they're both just standing there. And it's like, really? You guys are just standing here? And then they got in the big brawl and, you know, he made the giant look like a geek, which was to uh, set up. Him losing the title to the Giant in Giant's very first match. Sorry to spoil it for everybody, but that is what happens at Halloween Havoc. So what did you discover about Lucite? Oh, I, as soon as I saw that the crazy cost of Lucite, that's, uh, I stopped right there. Let's see. <laughs> Let me check I Wikipedia. Guess, it's quite the bargain. This pedestal table, quite the bargain at $60,000. All right. How, yeah, this is better. Uh, a three thousand dollar lucite trunk. It is a transparent plastic, sometimes called acrylic glass. Why don't you just say that? Because it's safety called lucite. glass. Safety glass. Let's see here. I'm just going to check the Wikipedia uh, uses. Uh, WCW 1995 <laughs> block of ice housing the debuting Yeti. Wow. Also, police vehicles for riot control. I did not know that. I just want to say that this... <laughs> what, uh, Greg? I wouldn't make that up. Yes, Vinny? This Nitro here with the de debut of the Yeti and the minus star and a quarter Kurosawa match, this was so much better than Raw. Oh, yeah. Like, the worst of Nitro... Okay, it's not the worst of Nitro. Is still better than the, Raw these the days. The worst of the first year of Nitro is still way better than Raw these days. Well... Maybe that's why they're not putting any Nitro on the network, although they finally did. I was not blown away with the show. but I, I wasn't blown away either, but it was better than Raw. It didn't hate it as much as Raw. No, and it's only an hour. It was it was a bad week of wrestling. It really was.